Hello and welcome to episode 86 of the QDR Crusaders for February 25th, 2014. My name is Rainbow Plasma. I'm the host of this podcast and the organizer. And uh, today I'm joined by... For no one. I coordinate special guests that I'm editing this week. Yay! I'm FutterGuy317 and I am the media manager for the podcast. And we are unfortunately missing uh, a certain Atmo Spark. Yeah, I, this is one of those situations where I'm pretty sure he didn't tell us why he's missing. He just said, I'm not coming next week. So it's like, <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah, we don't ask questions. We just accept it. And... Damn it, Joel! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we're kind of in a, an interesting situation because uh, Rainbow Plasma is actually visiting me for the week. Yeah. Um, which has been fun. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I have had to been working for the whole week so it's like you have a job what? yeah i know <laughs> well i mean that's the thing that because like i i mean a lot of the reason why i came down to see you is just to like relax so <laughs> i've been doing i've just been like sitting at home and playing video games while you're at work so it's not a big deal yeah and then that's uh, what i did <laughs> <laughs> and then uh i mean we've been watching stuff together and yeah but, yeah you know it's been fun but so right now we're recording um with rainbow plasma and myself on a single mic yeah um, so if the audio levels are a bit off on us, then I apologize. Um, I'm also not used to working on a microphone that's stationary because I usually work on a headset microphone, but you've got like a stationary mic, so I'm not sure how that's going to work. But direction matters. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I can't. I can't like turn away to look at something down the hall um, and uh, and talk because it won't carry my audio. But whatever. Yeah. It's yeah, fun we're... though because you can make like funny noises or yell really loudly and look away from your mic and do it all yeah. the time. Well, no, because because now I can just make funny faces while he's trying to talk <laughs> and then screw and, me up and, and, and screw you up. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, this is like the this is like one of the first times that like anybody any one of you guys has like recorded with me because mm -hmm. we've done uh, setups before. Like when we were at BronyCon uh, and we were recording with Mahauer, Burned Mahauer and myself were sharing a mic, um, and you I think were. What? Oh, <laughs> ignore that. Uh, I think I think you were on your own because you were part of that, and I think yeah, I, I don't think Atmospark was part of that podcast. Either. No, no, he um, wasn't. So that was that was interesting because then we kind of shared and we passed around a mic, but um, with this we're both sharing the same mic. This time our faces, which yeah. like... was fun because we kept fighting over the mic, yeah. like, you know, and then Mahauer was like, Oof, uh, uh, "Pass it over, <laughs> I want to say something." Yeah, no, yeah. By now, the way, now we're just pass. Now we're just pressing our faces together in order. Shout to out talk. to Mahauer, who's a year older as of like what a week ago. We definitely did said this like two podcasts. Didn't we wish him happy birthday already? Yeah, we, we did. did. <laughs> this is setting a dangerous. You precedent. only get one. <laughs> this is setting a very dangerous precedent. Yeah, yeah. we just like we. It's we're sorry. We can't. We can't resist the the man shower. It's it's too much. It, yeah, it, we can't. Anyways, anyhow. So, uh, so the theme for this week, we kind of decided last minute, and uh, it is Coco Pamel, who was the pony who was in Rarity Takes Manhattan. Um, she was the pony who gave our first key. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa! It's not confirmed yet. <laughs> but I heard Jeez. this guy. But I heard this guy named Rainbow Plasma. He's a pretty smart guy. You should yeah. know. He said something about it might be the first key. So I don't know. He might be crazy, but. He sounds like a smart guy, you know. I wonder if there's like people who like completely like haven't like watch our show before they watch the cartoon. Like... Oh yeah, by the way, spoilers <laughs> this entire episode. Oh um, yeah, but yeah, you kind of knew that already coming. No, this is this is at no, I'm, least I'm joking. This yeah. is at least a month old. This episode, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Like I, I think yeah, it's got to be at least a month old. This episode. So some guy who's like two months behind an episode is like, ah, no one how else. dare you? <laughs> All I watched was the first, all I watched was the opening episode, and now I'm spoiled the entire thing. I put your show over My Little Pony itself, and this is what I get. <laughs> <laughs> no respect, no respect. No, I don't have respect. Our yeah. show is not as good as the as MLP, so go watch it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Say so, some. So anyhow, um, so we kind of chose Pococo Pamel because she is extraordinarily cute, and she has a lot of fan art that was made uh, after the episode that she appeared in. So, uh, our first piece is called Coco Pamel, uh, self-explanatory <laughs> title there, by Frankier77. Um, yeah, well, you know, it doesn't lend itself to, when, when there's new characters, there's, there's, it doesn't always lend itself to creative titles. You kind of just go with the standard. Yeah. Uh, so this is an interesting piece. It's featuring Coco Pamel, uh, and she's got, obviously you can see 
the multicolored thread there that we think is the key. Yeah. And uh, you think I know? There's a bolt of thread and uh, a bunch of different stuff that's related to fashion and whatnot. People seem to really latch onto her because, uh, you know, she 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 seemed like a nice character. You know, it's just. And I mean, the, at the end of the day, a lot of people come to the show just because they like to see nice characters interacting and, and going on adventures yeah. and stuff and having conflicts. But at the end of the day, just just nice characters. And uh, she was a good character who was placed in a bad situation and and made the right choice and, and was a better person because of it. So to feel good I mean, kind of show, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, she, she was cute and she had original she had an original um, hair kind of uh, character design yeah. and her voice was different. So I'm 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 kind of really sad that they didn't bring her back to be rarity's assistant i mean like we've seen in the past That'd when they introduced new characters it's not like they have need to have them all the time but it would have been it would have been nice to kind of add i think as the show gets later on a lot of the shows fall into the trap of being too afraid to add characters in mm. i mean they've introduced quite a few new characters over the past right but they half. always go away the except for mish harshwini who came back Discord. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> and enough. Discord and uh Right. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think they are kind of um nervous about adding like characters that come back over and over again. Well you don't want to add too many like comeback yeah. characters, you know. Yeah, that's the thing. Like shows like Adventure Time have a ton and ton of characters, but each character has their own backstory, but you don't hear about it because like you just hear about them in relation to the episode. Right. But with a show like MLP, I think the writers try and build a backstory behind each character that you actually see in the episodes. And so, like, as they're in more episodes, they, they require more character development. And Yeah, that's why we attach to the character so much, because, like, they are given this, you know, dedication to uh, in all the episodes and stuff. Yeah. I just, I suppose, I suppose at the end of the day, like, wait... I like to see a little bit of progression in the world. I like to see world progression when it comes to shows. And uh, stuff like that is a little bit of world progression. Again, it, she doesn't even need to have speaking roles. Just mm -hmm. like seeing Rarity and, and they ha they have to go see Rarity. And in the background is Coco Pamel doing something. That just shows a little bit of world progress to me. Um, just like, you know, if they went to Fluttershy's Cottage and Discord was there. It's hard to have Discord there and not speak though. So I guess that doesn't. it's not really a good example. <laughs> but sometimes I like to see that in shows where they have a little bit of world progression. Um just little subtle things that that remind you of things that have happened in the past. Yeah. So it kind of proves to you that stuff has happened and that this these things kind of have an order to them. I could imagine on a show like this, though, where you have multiple writers, um, that obviously things are going to get lost in between. Like, you always have some people doing continuity checks for the writers of the show. But... Um, Stuff like this, I'm sure maybe maybe in later in the season and maybe next season we'll see hints towards Coco Pamel, but That'd be nice. hopefully. So anyhow, <laughs> back to this piece. Uh, this piece is interesting in that it does um, certain 3D effects to it, um, especially with the, the shading. Um, like you can see shading on her ear, um, shading on the face and her, her body. Um, and in addition to that, there's these like darker patches in her mane and tail that kind of um, give it a kind of a shadow to it and kind of put creases in her mane and tail. And it gives it kind of almost a papery feel to it, um, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It's because of how smooth everything is shaded, I guess, colored, softly gradiated pink color on her is and then like the bright white from the window in the background. So it does kind of give that concept that she, you know, takes up space in his 3D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was gonna bring up the word soft when it came to the shading because there there's a lot of the the soft shading on her especially. Uh, maybe not so much on the rest of the piece. Maybe a little bit on the curtains and stuff, but mostly mostly on her. They definitely gave her a very soft uh, it's kind of a shading mm -hmm. mixture of that soft shading and then hard edge shading, like in the hair, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's still like yeah. the mixture of it ends up giving a cool sense to things. Well, I think there's also a difference, too, between shadows that kind of merge on the body. Like, you know, the the top of her back uh, or, like, the that part of her, her neck, like, half of it is showing to the sunlight, whereas her hair, none of it would be showing to the light at all. So it, it, it has a... But you're right, they do definitely combine those two different things. Um, but it, that, in general, when you have this soft shading... It gives the uh, almost like the sense that the pony itself is soft, or again, kind of that roundness is a, is a big thing that happens there too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's interesting uh, that the artist kind of chose to to leave in those two places where there's line work, um, maybe three places on Coco Pamel where there's line work. You see it in her muzzle um, and in her forearm, um, and I I think that's just to kind of give more of a uh, contrast to those features. Um, yeah, probably because mm-hmm. it, it's kind of tough, especially if you're starting out with shading. To get the shading just right so that you don't have any line work in there and so that it actually does look like a muzzle. Um, yeah, it's a, because you have to show the difference in contrast, like you mentioned, with color or with value, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like on the bottom, like, what is it? I guess that's her forearm. Um, like, I probably could do without the line because you have that really bright area of, mm-hmm. like, the light bending around it that, that would hit, like, the shading. So it, it might have been okay on its own. Um, but the nose, like, how he chose to shade the face probably wouldn't come out very well. Mm-hmm. Also, it's, like, a line right there is also does a lot to help, you know, show, like, cute pony nose or, like, yeah. how it, we, it looks like she's smiling and stuff. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There was um, a couple episodes we talked about the fact that when you have, uh, when you try to make a pony 3D, like, give it, like, a 3D face, sometimes it's really hard to get it done really well mm-hmm. i think we we're talking about that with caramel brulee last week um but y- you you can either do like a 2d face with a lot of like harder lines like this where you have the nose it kind of flattens it i mean it does separate it so that you can see that it's a nose as opposed to just part of the face but it does flatten it compared to like the straight up 3d almost like model like um look mm-hmm. at, at model as in uh 3d model not as in like runway model (laughs) um but there's two different styles so a lot of times it's hard for artists to do the the full 3d uh and have it look okay so they they tend to put this line to kind of flatten it out give it more of a connection to the show um which has those kind of lines as well yeah and it definitely does add something to hair expression too um like we see a lot of artists that do um, kind of uh, extreme 3D um, or like try and get rid of lines and stuff like that. Like if you if you take a look at Assassin Monkey's work, for instance, um, his work is all painted. It's all pretty much lineless. Um, and his his expressions are, are very intricate and complicated and stuff. Um, and sometimes just getting off like the, the raw cuteness requires something very simplistic, like just adding a line like this. Yeah, like a nose. Yeah, it's a little nose boop, <laughs> or that, that uh, curl upwards. That we keep we keep mentioning the fact that we know an artist that does that curl upwards. Is that Leakfish that does that kind of? Mm, Leakfish is known for the very like prominent pony nose. Um, oh. she has a very specific way in which she does the like yes, like a very unique line for a nose. Like it's not along the same line as this, but uh, it, you know what I mean. There was another. There was another artist that we featured for our christmas episode or our holidays episode i don't think we featured league fish in a holiday episode Mm -hmm. um the one the one that was the fluttershy piece in the snow with angel bunny on top of there yes um it it had like the it was just like i don't know i don't know because league fish is like has the same kind of concept she's really known for using that one solid line for her nose and mouth both using the same like stroke and then often when looking at the front or side, she'll use an one more stroke for the chin. So she incorporates that chin as well. Yeah. Holiday piece with Fluttershy and Angel. Foxy Park. Noxy. Yeah. Yeah. It's Foxy Noxy. We, we just looked Fo- it up. It's, oh. Fo- it's oh, Foxy oh, oh, oh. Noxy. Yeah. I gotcha. Um, anyways, there's there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of artists who do that, where they where they do that kind of like one nose swoop and it imitates the mouth and it makes it look happy because it's a little smiling yeah. thing. It yeah. translates well because the like keyframes for ponies are that one single shape, you know, that is their like nose, their face. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and when looking at the front or side, like they're given that stroke, you know, so it yeah. translates well when you're doing like digital art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one more thing I want to mention on this this piece, I really like the like the element of space that's being given of how that like the table the thread and the things like that we see because they're larger and placed kind of onto the side there almost taking up like half of the picture mm-hmm. it creates the sense that they are like right up in our face and they're close to us and then she is farther away and like what she's leaning on is also like in the distance um i would have liked to see uh the shelf and items in the front actually become darker like they're like there's less light hitting them and they're like actually closer to our face, like some heavier use of shadow. Mm-hmm. I feel like that would help push them forwards. Um, but I just liked how the 
they were, I don't know, placed in the piece, like, as they are, creating yeah. a little sense of in your faceness. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the whole depth perception of Coco and the thing that she's holding or wheeling or whatever is, is really well done. But yeah, I agree that, like, um, because the, the things on the table are going to be fairly silhouetted in the light, um, it would be nice to see what it looks like with them a little bit more darker. Because they're the same kind of, like, value and the colors kind of have the same kind of tint and saturation and all that as all the other colors in the piece with the exception of the bright white coming from like the window so they kind of they blend in with everything else and they seem like they're on the same like plane if you know what i mean Mm -hmm. but if they had something else pushing them forward of being like darker in uh value uh then they'd probably be you know pushed forward towards our face a bit yeah i like i like the fact that they definitely put the threat and i guess to a certain extent the cup too because based on what we've seen in the show we know how big the thread is in comparison to a pony so when we look at that thread we don't go wow that's a big thread we we think oh it's it must be closer because it's bigger because we already know the size of that thread so uh that might just to just to explain to people out there why that might seem to you automatically like it's closer it's because we already know the size of that thread and we already know the size of that cup and we know that they're actually not that big so they must be closer what is a cute touch, though, is if you look at the thread, you notice how the left side is, like, peach-colored, and then the right-hand side is, like, a bright yellow, like, mm-hmm. whitish yellow. Um, the artist is showing the, like, curvature and shading with color, uh, mm-hmm. which is sometimes in a piece like this, when it's more subtle, like, soft shading, you sometimes don't notice that it's actually a color shift rather than, like, a just, like, a white or black shift. Because a lot of times when artists, like, start out, like, shading and stuff, they'll just use, like, transparent black or transparent <laughs> white and put it over things. But it's not so much just you're darkening a color or like lowering the value of a color a lot of times it's you're actually physically changing the color to like a completely different color so like on coco pamel she's what like that yellowish tannish Mm -hmm. um like very light almost whitish color and then she trans or she shifts into like a more pink like peach on in her gradient it's not just like a darker version of white you know yeah I am so guilty of using translucent black as a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whenever we do vectors and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, fantastic piece. We do have to move on to our next piece, though, which is called Where's My Coffee by Chingalin. Uh, and this is a very uh, exciting piece, I guess, is the correct word to use for it. Motion! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, you see diagonals in use here. I love ching- I, I love chingling. Yeah. I mean, like there was that the other piece that I recognize is that Fluttershy piece that we can see up here in the more like this um, that we featured before. Uh, I I just like the I like the style of it. Uh, I like the kind of way that he does faces is a big one to me. The way he does eyes really speaks to me. Um, and I mean, like that. Honestly, ninety percent of the time when I'm looking at artists and and what I like about them, that really stands out to me. Uh, like if I were to just block the face, it kind of becomes, well, it's it's still well. I mean, it's still well done. It's a good artist, obviously, but but that's what stands out to me about about his work a lot of the times is is the is the faces. But it's interesting looking through his gallery because he's got like four or five different styles going on. Uh, I've noticed last time that we featured him. I think we talked a little bit about that. Um, but anyways, I, I, yeah, I love this piece. Um, it's got, not only does it got, does it have motion, it's got hatching in terms of shading, which is really mm-hmm. interesting. A couple types of shading. Um, it's got some, inter- it's got an interesting thing with Tom there. <laughs> um, the, the kind of non-realistic action bubble, like almost like a comic book yeah. thing. It's got textures in the background as opposed to, it's got like three layers of textures in the background, mm-hmm. which is really cool. And uh, this artist I know likes to work with textures. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, there's like eight things right there. If you guys want to expand on them, I'm just going <laughs> to sit here drooling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoy the, like, in this piece specifically, I um, really like his use of um, color and shading, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like the really bright blue. I find that it's like... It's not over the top. It's kind of cool. It's kind of gives it gives a lot of pieces like in his gallery, just like one big solid color, like things of color. Um, And I also like the shading, like the hatching is done really well. And uh, it's also, again, it's shaded in color. Like now everything's being shaded in that blue that is her hair and like the background and taking of everything. Mm -hmm. Also, there's kind of a use of um, going as far like the colors. There's a use of like red, yellow and blue. It's kind of like 
primary. So you've got like the little thing in her hair, cutie mark, ribbon, and then yellow in the cup and yellow in Tom, the little action bubble around Tom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very little. There, there's a there's a tiny bit of purple, but you don't see a lot of green and you don't see any orange. Yeah. Again, very little if you count the cup, but that's close enough to yellow, really. Yeah. <laughs> Um, something that's interesting in the shading is that I think, uh, all of the shading is done in one single color. So it's not like done using different shades of the same color. Um, but the artist kind of used the hat, the hatching to give, I guess, different senses of depth of shading. Oh, like you mean like the more hatching, the darker? Yeah. Like, cause that's on, on her underside, um, there's no hatching whatsoever. And then you can see like on her front left hoof like as you get closer to the the point of the hoof there's some hatching on it i don't know if it's like purposeful or if i think it's just an interesting mix of hatching and like use of color because mm -hmm. i'm probably i'm assuming how this artist made the piece was it started out with like just a line sketch you know mm -hmm. and then went under and colored everything like underneath the line sketch because like all the lines are very um, they're just still kind of messy, like unkept. And you can really tell that, you know, it was like, it was done quickly. Um, and which is a cool feeling. Like it's still a, a neat, a unique like style to like draw a pony, but mm -hmm. it's not like really super intricate, careful ink work. It's <laughs> still, you know, um, kind of, it has a sketchy esque feel like that's being given by the, how some of the lines like match intersect. And then obviously in the hatching, so yeah. then I'm assuming that after that point, he went over and put, you know, basic areas of color and then started adding areas of shading. And so he's mixing and leave, like purposely leaving the hatching there and like putting the shading underneath it. So it's how he kind of incorporates the 3D element of the blue shading and then the hatching with it, you know. Mm -hmm. So for the record, hatching is totally a word that we just use, right? Because, I mean, we, no. we talked about no. we talked about crosshatch. <laughs> I remember when we first talked about it, we talked about crosshatching and then we looked at this and we were like, well, that's like hatching, but it's not crossed. I mean, of course, it might be it might be a legitimate term, but I don't think any of us have ever looked it up. I think we just went with this. <laughs> no, 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 it, it, it makes it, sense to us. It it is exactly. It makes sense it, to us. It is a legitimate term. Have uh, you looked it up? Yeah, you're a liar. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> you're definitely no, a liar. No, but uh, but seriously, uh, because um, well, where I work, I I I work on laser cutting machines, and so I've made some uh, some ponies out of laser cut metal. And when I'm using vectors to kind of make the, the designs for the ponies, you have to use hatching to get any sort of, like, shading done on it or any distinction of areas and stuff. Um, so there is a, a difference because you, I basically used cross-hatching for the eyes, which gives it a darker feel, and then for any areas of shading or, like, strokes or whatever, I just use standard hatching. <clears throat> hatching. Hatchure in French is an artistic technique technique used to create tonal or shading effects by drawing or painting or scribbling with closely closely spaced parallel lines. I, I love the, I love the fact that the second the second you started talking about that, I could hear Burn typing, and I was like, he's googling it. <laughs> well, first hit on Google. Thank you, Wikipedia. Yeah, you're welcome for the time, by the way, <laughs> to find that. Uh, but so we talked about motion in this piece, uh, and one, one thing that gives motion is obviously the, the whole diagonal composition, um, f from Coco being at a diagonal to the, the angle of viewing, um, to the coffee mug being at a, basically an opposite diagonal, um, but you also get these kind of motion lines at, uh, behind her butt and her rear legs, um. Which is kind of something you would see in, I guess, more of a cartoonish or anime kind of thing, um, mm -hmm. just to give that motion a little bit more definition. And comic books too. Yeah. Um, Again, kind of fitting that comic theme that you see in with with Tom, mm -hmm. and it's got a little bit of that comic kind of like uh, silliness to it. The fact he's got a name tag. Yeah. <laughs> so I also I get that in the style because everything's being outlined too, so it kind of gives a little bit more like illustration. Oh yeah, it's sense. got that like white outline around. White outline and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I always whenever I see that white outline, it always reminds me of uh, Paper Mario, because yeah. Paper Mario had like a really thick like comic, uh, papery outline. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, also her her eyebrows are above her hair, so it's 
got that going for it. Oh too. yeah, that's anime very, yeah, very yeah. slightly. Yeah, yeah. I think even in the style of the eyes too. Like obviously, it's not it's not a show esque style. It's more of like a it translates more into manga, manga or whatever oh and my stuff God, like that. I <laughs> love his eyes. I love yeah. Jingling's eyes. It's it's that was the thing that took me the most and in that Fluttershy piece, and uh, this one is just like. I just love the way he does it. I love the way that they glow, mm-hmm. you know, like they, that he takes the eyes themselves are really easy, but then he takes those like spots, the eye spots, the eye shine, I guess you call it, right? Yeah. Um, and he actually makes them shine. Uh, I just, I love it about it. I don't know. I, don't I know like how, how he plays it. with the iris. Like he will kind of show, cause it's, it's a manga thing to show like the pupil and then the, like an oval area around it. Right. But then he goes with like a larger area around that and then will kind of segment and fracture that with like almost spiky things. If you look at the right right eye, how there's like the lighter cyan that goes to darker cyan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so like playing with that, it's not a gradient, mind you. It's kind of like broken harshly and it ends up looking really cool. And yeah. they don't actually have pupils like in terms of like black pupils. They just yeah. have like a, a, a uh, an oval to be like, this is where the pupil would go. If it wasn't already filled in with color. <laughs> um, well, also, I think um, the fact that in this piece specifically, the pupils, how they aren't filled in and how they're very small and dilated also gives that sense of shock, you know, because she yeah. is like dropping the coffee that she's um, supposedly going to be bringing to someone. Hence the title, Where's My Coffee? Yeah. yeah. And you can also get that feeling from the, the beads of sweat dropping off of her face and and tears yeah <laughs> yeah that's another that's another I, anime thing that like the the like tears in the corner of the eyes not actually crying but just almost like it's like halfway in between crying and not crying yeah mm-hmm. i totally forgot the name of the antagonist in that episode i don't uh, care yeah I, mean, <laughs> yeah I mean like coco pamela was like i mean she wasn't nearly as big of a character but i guess her name is just like um sticking with us more just because yeah she's like so we much all more like, enjoyable yeah <laughs> yeah we all like the good character like we all think she's designed better we all think she was cuter and she was much nicer so we all attach to her so there's tons of fan art yeah um there's only one piece of her in the art like this yeah siri 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 oh yeah, yeah. siri siri polo oh, yeah. yeah 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 <laughs> also thank you to um wizard glitter what, for her piece, <laughs> yeah. Coco and Suri by Wizard Glitter. Thank you for giving me that name. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Not not too shabby. <clears throat> yeah. I like the expression. Anyway, uh-huh. all right. You're saying. So we're gonna move on to our next piece, which is called "Better Be Done Before the End of Coffee Break" by none other than Jowie Bean, who we featured quite a bit on the show and who uh, is a fan of our show. So sure. shout out to you. Shout out, UK accents. <laughs> Hi, Jelly Bean. Um, so speaking of the UK, the first thing, Vern, Vern brought this piece to our attention, and the first thing that I noticed is the keep calm and have coffee sign in the room because it is a very, very <laughs> British thing to have. But it's so <laughs> overplayed nowadays. Isn't Every, it, it was a British thing like three years ago. Like when I went to, when I went to um, it could be England <laughs> in like like eight years ago, it was a thing there and yeah. like so but nowadays it's become like popular among like the states and like other parts of europe and stuff with like younger people mm-hmm. um so now it's a thing everywhere but it, it did originate in world war one or two yeah. what i don't uh, remember i don't remember i don't know we're not a what, history what podcast did? The, the, keep... the keep calm and carry on yeah oh okay that phrase i always yeah, thought yeah. you were talking about coffee i'm like what? <laughs> no 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 the, the original has been around for the original the original is keep calm and carry on and yeah. it was and it was yeah. in one of the world wars it was a poster that was that was hung up in order to uh keep people motivated while there was horrible wars happening around them yeah mm-hmm. no but i think that's funny when you said with the like coffee like keep calm and have like coffee but i mean it's like it's the stereotypical like uk or british thing yeah, as tea. like tea like isn't it yeah, yeah. It could yeah. be tea. Um, Westernization. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, I'm not really sure. It's a very... It's it's most definitely tea. I'm quite positive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what is it? It's it's a very European thing to, like, have coffee, like, as, like, a ritual. Like, when I was in Germany, like, every single day, we had coffee in the morning, and then we had a coffee break after lunch, mm-hmm. and then we had coffee and cake for dinner. Oh, yeah. 
and I was like, what is with all this coffee? <laughs> and there's like cafes like everywhere is in like they have to be there. Yeah. We joke about Starbucks in the US because it's convenient. But no, like in Germany, even in the most rural and country of areas, like there's a cafe <laughs> with coffee. And like you have to have your coffee and like don't even get me started on Spain. Oh my goodness, the coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it's funny that you say that because um I went to Austria to visit a vendor of the place that I work at. And um literally every single day at like ten o'clock we would have a coffee break. And then at eleven oh. o'clock we would have a coffee break. And it's just like, huh, well, these these guys must love their coffee. Yeah, it's one of those like <laughs> ritualistic things, you know? Which yeah. just sometimes goes unnoticed in culture. Hmm. Anyway. Uh yeah, so this Art. piece, <laughs> Burned, you brought yeah. it up, so so would you like to start us off? Ta. Um, I actually really like this piece. Well, for one, I really like Jowie Bean, because he has a very, like, unique, expressive way of illustrating almost, like, everything he does. Like, it's very cartoony. Like, he's, I feel like he's a cartoonist at heart, mm -hmm. um, and every every expression he does, and, like, on his face is always, like, illustrated to a point where it's kind of... Not not extreme, but it's kind of over the top, giving that car cartoony sense, which which is cool, you know. Would the word ridiculous be too would be too harsh? Because it sounds, I feel like you could use ridiculous in a nice way. I like I like ridiculous as a descriptive term, though. Hmm. Because it's like it's not it's not a term I use to be. Um, what, what do you want to say? <laughs> I don't know. You it's don't... just like I really like the term gross. <laughs> it's like it's a t it's a term and it describes things. So like. Yeah. I, I feel like ridiculous over the top are terms that are actually, you know, in to, to my sense, at least um, endearing, like mm -hmm. I think they're good terms. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to get you on a ramble about <laughs> semantics. Off Go track. on. Anyway, what I was trying to get at is I like his facial expressions because of how expressive they are, just said simply. Um, and I also like his sketches like this to me, like looks like one of his sketches, you know, because it is all the line work and stuff. If we took out all the uses of value. It's um, very, like, expressive, loose, quick, like, black lines, all, like, creating this huge environment, which is done really cool. And then he's gone back over it with, um, like, using, using like, value, using um, this kind of uh, muted blue and then kind of a whitish yellow uh, and, like, everything around in the piece. Um, and what caught me about it and why I really liked it is it kind of gives this... It gives, it gives like, a really, like, good narrative. It's kind of, like, sad feeling and, like, the tone... And the subject of what is, like, Coco Femelle, like, doing, like, hard work for the villainess character in the sense, the antagonist, is, like, she is, like, being illuminated. So, like, the subject of the piece is kind of being illuminated, so it directs our focus on, like, the right, on the right-hand side. And I also really liked, like, completely uh, skip, skipping around all the things I really enjoy in the piece. <laughs> it creates a really interesting um, area of space in how he sketched everything. Um, so, the diagonal lines on the floor and then, like, diagonal lines of the table... Like, mind you, it's not super, like, perfect and, like, super neat, but how he does it ends up giving us a real um, uh, unique interpretation of space that we feel like we're in this, it feel like we're in this area, in this room. So, like, the things in the foreground, like, of, uh, like, the comics and the, or al albums or whatever is in, like, the right and left and the little objects in the front. And then all the objects placed throughout the room and in the back and like the angles created by the tables and then the roof and the window, they give this kind of, um, I don't know, enveloping sense. Yeah, it feels like a full-fledged 3D room as opposed to kind of like cutting off half of it and sticking a camera somewhere. Uh, it's almost like the camera's behind something. It's on the wall. And, it, and when you've got a camera that seems like it's on the wall, then it gives a sense that there is a wall behind you and that you are in a room. Mm-hmm. Just like even how he describes everything in in this picture, I feel like I'm it. I feel like I'm more in the space than I do in our first first example with Coco Pamel in that kind of very subtle light like shaded area. Yeah. Um, I feel much more enveloped in this example. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. Um. No, I I totally get that. It like. It it almost comes off like if you if you ignore the whole sketchiness of it and the expressions and stuff, it almost like comes off as as a real setting, um, and it feels very much like a uh, like an earlier Disney kind of film setting um, where you have like the the scenery in the background and the whole room is does have this very large feeling of depth because of the values used and because of the way that the sketch lines are set out and stuff like that and 
it's it's really nice i i think it's done really really well um something that i, I dig it. something i wanted to point out um which is not related to anything technical but it, i just find it really um fun is that the sewing machine uh is just a a few lines um like the the sewing head mm-hmm. um which i'm i'm guessing is used just to convey motion and to just be be a quick sketch but uh i don't know just it i i found it interesting and funny i love how much stuff he's incorporated like into the background and like in everything like in the background like sketches and drawings on the wall like his just his basic sketches are so ridiculously detailed in their environment and in the setting like this narrative to this space is really being given by just the tons of crud everywhere. Like on the table, we have a little tiny owl. We have like two <laughs> sewing spindles, like scissors. Um, on the wall behind her, there's like a pin for a little cushion for needles. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of the posters like being like slapped on top of each other with like poogie. Is that supposed to be a, a like a spin on Gucci or something? Puggy, probably, yeah. Puggy. <laughs> I, I don't know. And then the, what is it, like the duck-faced like uh, model pony in the background. <laughs> and I really like the it's almost like a Marilyn Monroe-esque pin-up pony on the <laughs> left. Yeah. That kind of face with like the lip. So like I really dig that too. Well, we've talked before a little bit about how um, when you have a when you have a clear focus in a piece you can leave out details in the surrounding things because your brain fills it in. But here, it's supposed to look messy and cluttered, so you're supposed to be looking around a lot. You might be drawn, because of the lighting that you talked about at the very beginning, you might be drawn to a certain area of the piece, but in general, you want to be looking around. You're looking outside. Oh, there's a bunch of buildings out there. They're all detailed. Mm-hmm. There's a poster here. There's another poster. Oh, look, there's a painting. Oh, look at that flower. There's a spider around, up top you know? by the light. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice that until now. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it kind of gives this messy feel because your eyes are doing a very messy scan over the piece it's not picking it doesn't have a flow to it it's just like left right up down you know um ba select and start Uh, thank you that's not the konami code don't don't crucify me for not saying it exactly (laughs) uh yeah yeah i mean there's just so much in this piece and it's it's all done uh so fantastically and uh, even though it is like in a sketchy style, it's done very, very quickly. I think that kind of um, gives it its own character, and that that is kind of something that that Joey Bean does quite a bit is take a sketchy style and uh, kind of convert it into a full fledged piece that looks really nice and is really kind of enveloping. Yeah, I like it. I love I love it. A really super loose and sketchy and quick. Mm-hmm. Um, I find I attach, but when done well, you know, like I find I attach to something to this like a sketch like this like done really quickly and like some awesome uses of value that's not just black and white it's actually like yellow and blue um i attach to something like this a lot more than i do to pieces like in our first example with like you know it's very carefully calculated like smooth gradients and soft looking ponies and like very exact line work and outside edges um i find i enjoy things like this a lot more well, that's a preference burned. <laughs> I know. Well, it it makes sense. That's why because, I said I like five times. Yeah, it makes sense because like uh, it's experiment experimentation with like a lot of different things, and uh, you know if if you do everything by the book, it's not like I, I mean it, it'll look nice, and uh, I do like a lot of like the three D esque ponies, um, but it's not like it doesn't have character or or style um, on its own. Like it's not unique. Uh, whereas something like this, Jawi Beans kind of struck a chord with this unique style of his. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So we do well, have to move on to our last piece. Sorry. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> I was just going to compliment more things, which I've done enough. Yeah. Well, you know, we love you, say Jawi. The background environment <laughs> looks wonderful. Yeah. All right. So our last piece is called "The First Key" by Atril, uh, who we featured and praise nonstop on the show. Um, (laughs) but this is a picture of uh, Coco looking at the thread and there's a picture of a key superimposed on top of it because like us, Atril believes that the thread is the key. So shout out to you (laughs) because you're probably right. Why wouldn't it be? What else is the need for the giant rainbow gradient? Shout out out to me. Oh, yeah, sure. Now we're all coming around and saying, oh, no, it's obvious. It was always so obvious. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) But you weren't there from the beginning. (laughs) I was the one who said, well, anyways, uh, I'm not going to, I'm just joking. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, this this one will be quick. We've got other stuff to talk about after this uh, and some questions to get to. But this one's quick, you know. You know a trill, you know what he does well, his style's great. Um, but a couple things to stand out for this one. Uh, the textures in this piece seem to be a little bit heavier than normal. We talked a little bit about how he always likes to put subtle textures into his pieces in order to make uh, the colors look a little bit less flat because he usually uses pretty flat colors and then adds shading on top of it. Um, so he uses textures to give a little bit uh, more oomph and it'll seem a little bit more natural. Uh, but then the lighting as well is really fantastic. Not only the choice of colors and how he makes them really glow, but also the reflection of the colors in the eyes and... and uh, the reflections the of the piece. colors on the hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in, in general. Yeah. I really, really love when artists can do that kind of reflected colors correctly in uh, both glossy and matte materials, like her hair, which is fairly matte, and in her eyes, which is fairly glossy. Um, so, I, I mean, this this piece, and Atril is, is a fantastic artist, but this piece kind of speaks to me in that sense that, like, um, you know, obviously you have the thread, which is rainbow-colored, and it's emitting this rainbow-colored light, and you get, like, these um, these reflections on, on Coco that match that. Um, I don't know. I just, it always it amazes me when artists are able to do that, right? Yeah. So. Also, it's a really nice touch that he chose to illustrate the boxes he did mm -hmm. um, with one side being like much larger than the other and the far side like being much smaller because it our brain interprets it that we're super close to said box mm -hmm. and it makes it look like much larger than it is. But we can tell like it's a small box, you know, All right? Yeah, kind of an interesting, interesting touch is looking at that. Yeah, there's the whole field of view thing. Um which, if you play first-person video games, um, <laughs> you, you kind of know that, you know, different video games have different fields of view, and some of them, like in Minecraft, you can adjust the field of view. But, uh, it's or just like in Daisy. Or in Daisy. <laughs> um, but it's just that uh, when we talk about field of view, it's um, how large, closer-up objects look in the... Uh, in this in this piece, obviously the box, the front, the edge that's closest to us is obviously a lot larger. So it's meant to be that you're close up, and it's I don't know. Gives you it's that a little kind of again to use that term blown out of proportion. You know, it's like not accurate. Yeah, but it's done. Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. There's also there's also this interesting uh, aspect with just the general composition of the fact that it's very very vertical composition. <laughs> uh, enjoy that, viewers. It's gonna look great on screen. I bet. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, it, it's it's got a really interesting. It kind of like compresses inwards, and again, kind of makes you feel a lot closer. It feels like it's squeezing you in a little bit hmm. because it's such a vertical composition. So squeezing yeah. you in sideways also kind of tricks your brain into squeezing you in forward, makes you look closer. You're right there. Kind of goes with what we're saying about the field of view. Yeah. Um, so burned if if you want, you can put a picture of this with the value being shown and you can also put one with like rainbow crazy colors no he doesn't do it. that i do that <laughs> i'm the one who edits that he thinks oh, yeah. he thinks it's bad yeah. um i don't think it's bad i just sometimes i enjoy the centralized composition on the screen more than i enjoy having something next to it yeah i don't fair enough um can i just take a moment to gush no at no <laughs> <laughs> yes to, to gush over a troll's ears um <laughs> they're so like i don't even puffy know they're, they're, I, like the only word that puffy. i know because like puffy and fluffy don't even describe it because like the base ears themselves like not just yeah. the fur but just like everything about them they're just like they're just fat ears and i love it <laughs> i know he's got this unique style with them and it's in every single one of his pieces and they're just oh it's so good and they're not just in his pieces they're in his copycats pieces as yeah. well but they're, um, <laughs> they're huge and volumous yeah, yeah. They, they've definitely got this and, and i mean I kind of get that with most a lot of his pieces. He's not afraid to make the ponies look kind of like really round, not necessarily mm -hmm. chubby because that's a different thing entirely. Yeah. But just like I don't know, just just not afraid to give them more curve. volume. Yeah, volume esque. Yeah, kinda. yeah, yeah. Volume esque—the um, word I made up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because in the show they're they're fat or they're rather flat. Um, straight and, lines and stuff like that there's a little yeah. bit of there's a little bit of uh bounce in their step when it comes to their hooves they've got a little bit of marshmallow hooves yeah but they do have a lot of straight lines marshmallowy like... there we go that's a good word to use <laughs> and, 
he a trill adds extra marshmallow to his ponies yeah how about that mm. anyways all right so we do have to move on we have a couple of uh sculptures that we wanted to kind of point out because sculptures are art and uh we don't really get to them often enough um and there's quite a few amazing sculptures out there um but we found one sculpture which is called i guess just coco Pamel by frozen pyro 71 and there's also a cute little sculpture by blind faith boo um of coco with the thread and in the frozen pyro version the thread is normal size and it's coco Pamel. Uh, just holding it, and in the Blind Faith Boo sculpture, uh, the it's thread is a, huge, and Coco it's a Pomelo tiny is tiny. Pony. Is it huge, or is she small? She's tiny! It could be both. Nah, it makes her more adorable if she's tiny. Yeah. But yeah, so so there you go. There's a couple of pictures on screen for you guys, because we like to show off a little bit. It's, it, I mean, it's it's hard to analyze. We're not, we're not really mm. sculpture people. Or we're, not, we're not really good at analyzing that, but that doesn't mean we can't give... Shoutouts to people who make awesome, uh, awesome artistic uh, ventures like these. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blind Faith Boo should have named her little sculpture Coco Patini. <laughs> uh, uh, it's it's tough when like we're talking about like physical medium um, art because like like sculptures or like the wood carvings that uh, who is it Firemane does or did yep. um, just because like. It's hard to capture it in a single picture or even in multiple pictures. Um, That's why it's really nice when the artists do like full round shots or like video shoots or whatever yeah. where they show like multiple pictures of like said thing. So like uh, Frozen Pyro has a little another series where it's like it shows the his little model from like all the different angles. And yeah, like a awesome 360 of it. Angles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Anyways, so we thought we'd give them. a shout out to them. Mm-hmm. We always like to give shout outs to, to people like that. We try to do that more often. Yeah. Anyways, question time, Cunis? Yeah, Cunis. Cunis. We don't have a troll here, though. So are you going to so, fill so, in? So Cunis is a thing now. Like, <laughs> I, I <so> Success. The, <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> like, the Cunis thing started when we were writing that joke for the YouTube intro, Burned and I, by ourselves, <laughs> like little weenies, and we, and we said Cunis. <laughs> Um, but I guess that's the thing now. I yeah. like it. It's yeah. a it's a CAC meme like yeah. value. Cunis. Yeah. All right. Anyways. Cunis. Um. So yeah. Uh. I guess I'll I'll do the questions. Yeah. yeah um. Yeah. So yeah. Uh. Our first question. Well, both of our questions are from Otaku AP this week. But our very first one is: If you had a giant robot, what would it be like? Oh. Gerd. I picked weird questions this week. Yeah. You did. <laughs> I know exactly why you picked this question, too. That's true. I did pick this question for a particular reason, because I wanted to talk about Titanfall. Or rather, <laughs> not talk about it, but just mention the fact that it looks great. Yeah. So if I if I had a giant robot, it would be one that I'd be able to ride in, like like the ones from Titanfall. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I'm just suffering from withdrawal, because I managed to time this trip exactly when Titanfall is is doing its beta <laughs> yeah so i'm not like la- i can't play it so i'm just watching videos of it going like eh, i want to play yeah uh so yeah well uh, shout it- out to all the let's plays that we've been watching <laughs> yeah, with Titan. <laughs> um but yeah if i had a giant robot i would want one that i could ride in like that i i don't even have to do anything maybe it shoots by itself maybe it's like a transformer that i can ride in and it's sentient and it does it o- its own thing i don't care i just want to ride in it yeah that'd be cool um i'm gonna go off on a tangent here oh boy uh just because people probably don't know this, uh, but it also has a connection to a question that you were looking at earlier, but we didn't include. Um, in high school, I was on our high school's robotics team. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and that was a lot of fun. For four years, we basically created robots um, as part of the first robotics competition. Um, and so I kind of have first-hand experience with actual robots. Um but they weren't giant, so that doesn't really relate to the question. So, <laughs> um, if I had a giant robot, I like the idea of using a giant robot for transportation because while cars and driving is nice, it can take a while to get places. So I would probably, actually, I would choose a robot that could transform into a jet, and I could use it to get places. Robot, ooh, yeah. Maybe it doesn't have to transform into a jet. Maybe it just has like rocket boosters like yeah rocket feet yeah 
Makes uh, sense. Rocket feet. <laughs> hint, hint, burn. burn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, giant robot. I'm surprisingly not like a huge fan as I think I'd be of giant robots because back in the day I used to like always watch like Gundam and like Big O I think was the thing on Toonami. Hmm. Um, when I think yeah. mechs yeah. that are cool, the first things that come to mind are like the I really liked in you know the Matrix series like those little things oh, they'd get in yeah that was yeah. like really gritty that was or kind of like the really really like gritty realistic ish looking mm. me- mechs that I could right. think of of just like weird like basically extensions of you with big guns mm-hmm. oh, that's cool but then again um I suppose back in the day I did watch like Power Rangers and what was that other one with like the animal things the there was what do you mean the power rangers series where they like transformed? no it wasn't power rangers it was something else with big like mechs but it was like kid oriented uh damn it it's like my favorite my friend's favorite cartoon he's gonna tell me <laughs> it's like my favorite cartoon but i can't remember, <laughs> I can't the, remember name. the name it's my friend's favorite cartoon i just remember it being on and it being cool um anyways mm, i i don't know i don't know what it is but yeah but whatever describe describe just very quickly what what the heck you're talking about if i hit <laughs> Um, it was like, there were the Zoids, that was it. I was uh, going to say there's giant arenas where Zoids would fight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the cartoon. Um, and a giant robot, it would be like, it would probably be like in the robots, like, Vigo, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Huh. Cool. Awesome. All right. Question Sweet. number two, again, from Otaku AP. How would you react if you suddenly become colorblind? Mm. <laughs> See, this is really funny to me because he's been in this giant like art battle with uh, Lake Customer for like the past <laughs> couple weeks. I know yeah. it's adorable. Yeah, it's been I great. <laughs> <laughs> Lake Customer X Otaku AP OTP. Oh yep. my gosh, can we get some so fan much. art of that, please? <laughs> yes, thank you. Please. I appreciate yeah. that. We please. have we have enough fan art of us. We need fan art of our artists that we feature. Exactly. <laughs> so that needs to happen now. We will uh, shout you out so hard. Um, yeah. For sure. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like out of any of the afflictions, you know, people always ask us like hypothetical questions like, if you were to lose any, like one sense, um, what which one would it be? Like yeah. touch, sight, <laughs> smell, whatever, taste. Yeah. Uh, the, the the last one. Um, mm. Hearing, mm. something like that. You know, you have touch, sight, five smell, senses, taste. Right? I, I know. Don't get into this semantics <laughs> crap. You know what, what I mean. What about the sixth sense? Uh, there's like eight, but the, there's like twelve. I see dead 20. people. Oh, that's not. Let's not get into this right now. There's no way. There's twenty. You are you are lying through your teeth Temperature. on that one. Temperature. Get out. Stop. <laughs> um, but yeah, touch. I feel like I feel it's like not... that. That's like a much less bad version of like the blind one where you pick your eyes so but like mm. i don't know it, it's two different things like colorblind versus blind because blind would be awful no offense to any blind watchers i'd be very surprised if we had blind fans who were watching <laughs> an art podcast hey we we Which, uh, I, we yeah. advertise ourselves as an audio podcast with visuals to help yeah so Anyways, um, I suppose it's a good way to get exposed to like visual art if you can't see it. Like, it's true. Mm-hmm. It's true. No, no. I'm what? What the heck am I talking about? This I entire no this idea. entire podcast is about visual art. I don't know why I'm saying like, <laughs> blind people would watch our podcast. Um, anyways, uh, if I became colorblind, it really wouldn't be a big deal to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. I, it would be it would be weird, definitely, because suddenly you can't see colors that you that you have seen for your entire life and it would be a bit strange adjusting to it but it i don't know that would be more of that would be less devastating and more i mean fun might not be the right word but <laughs> i mean you that's something that i could definitely easily see the the bright side of mm-hmm. that would i mean that's not a big deal to me at all yeah i mean what i do for work and for fun like i don't think that that suddenly becoming colorblind would really affect me in any way um it would probably be more entertaining for the podcast if one of us suddenly became colorblind. Because then it's like, we would always be like, well, what does it look like to you? Yeah. <laughs> we should just constantly tr- like call a customer and be like, hey, we were looking for your opinion on this thing. Oh, yeah. Reference <laughs> in case people don't know or didn't watch our interview, um, our friend, late customer, uh, who was on the show. And he's uh, an amazing artist. Yeah. He, he's uh, he's colorblind. Uh, Hi, in, Dave. In some way. <laughs> yeah. So, Burned, how about you? How would you re- how would you react if you suddenly become colorblind? 
Um, it'd be pretty interesting because, like, I happen to be in like art school right now currently and like making art and I'm actually in color theory currently mm. <laughs> so like and um as is I feel like I'm a pretty experienced colorist is actually the correct term it's kind of a in big that deal. I understand and can see colors very well um mm -hmm. and like temperatures of color like I have very good reading on that and stuff uh and I really like interactions of color as like I like a nerdy sense, you know, um, I, I really nerd out on concepts like that in art and color theory and I'm having a lot of fun in color theory. Hmm. So okay. like if I suddenly became color, colorblind, I'd be actually, like, you'd probably be a little bit more de devastated, much more sad just because like seeing the interactions of color and things like art is a huge joy for me. Mm hmm. So not like that being X nated wouldn't be so much of like an interesting experience to see how it changes or something. It would be a loss of something I really enjoy, you know. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you also kind of be interested? Maybe not, you know, for your entire life it might be difficult. But at the beginning, wouldn't it be kind of interesting just to see the new color combinations that that you might experience because of the color blindness? Um, I'm talking like when I think of it, I don't think like black white color blind. I think like normal like most common colorblind. Yeah, no, yeah. it's still like, because I, I have a lot of friends who are colorblind. Like my best friend yeah. is actually colorblind. It's funny because you can't see see pink. It's actually gray to him. Huh, right, um, yeah. It's the red green. Yeah. Most common. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't think I'd be like interested to see color interactions at all because I would understand what those colors were or are and how I can't see them. Um, and it would be very like a disappointing thing. Yeah. As it's, harsh it's as that. different when you're born that with sounds. it. So, like, I have a lot of respect for someone like a uh, late customer mm -hmm. who is actually, like, an established artist. So, like, he'll come uh, to us on Skype sometimes and be like, hey, like, can I get an opinion on, like, how these colors look? Because um, it's, like, because he has to actually have, like, a palette that he picks from because there's a few, there's, like, there's a couple colors in the spectrum that he can't see, you know? Hmm. So, it's, like, like, huge props to someone like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always find it fun to to look at the correlation between colors and people's favorite ponies because there's a couple of colorblind artists and, and we always talk to them and like their favorite ponies are like are like vinyl scratch because she's got like the blue and the white or or a Sorin or ponies like that that are just like blue because bl blue is something very easy that that they don't lose mm -hmm. so those kind of those kind of ponies look the same or very similar to the one to the kind of colors that we see yeah, a concept of blindness in art though is really interesting to me. Um, a like blindness towards anything. So like color blindness is the common one, but another thing that sometimes people don't know about is like there's a uh, a condition called facial blindness, um, and you can be face blind, meaning that if you're looking at someone and talking to someone, if they turn their head or if you like look away and then look back and you see them at a different angle, you cannot physically recognize them. Your brain does not comprehend that. Hmm. Um, and one of like the most famous contemporary artists right now whose name escapes me was actually Chuck Close was the artist I was thinking of. Yeah, he has he has he has facial blindness yeah. and he um, actually became um, paralyzed, I believe, from like the waist down mm -hmm. or neck down or something. Um, I shouldn't be talking about this. I'm not super educated on it. But um, he he made huge facial portraits throughout his career of like pictures and portraits. So like if he has a picture of someone's face, he can recognize that because it's always at the same angle. So he'll always recognize that picture. So he would paint huge self portraits of himself, like pictures of people. He created like this really famous, awesome, giant self-portrait of like 10 feet of his own face which is super cool hmm. and then when he became paralyzed he kept like painting his own like like self-portraits and pictures and faces like in squares and blah blah like he's really cool artist really cool stuff but yeah it's how his like actual condition of facial blindness affected like art in his career and how he chose to like paint stuff like that hmm. uh, is is an interesting concept but not something i would like to experience yeah Fair enough. I think it affects people differently. Anyways, so we do have to wrap up. Um, so I guess I will do the plugs. No, Burned has to do it. He does. You did. You did the. What did you do again? What did, I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I'll just do, do the this show anymore. Just, <laughs> do it. just fine. Just do it. Okay. We have a DeviantArt page, which is QDArt crusaders.dvnart.com we have a, an email account which is qdrcrusaders at gmail.com we have a facebook page which is qdrcrusaders on facebook 
And we have a Twitter account, which is QDR Crusade. You can go like us there or follow us or email us or whatever. Match.com <laughs> slash QDR Crusaders. <laughs> Not a thing. Fine, fine is there. Next week's theme is right here. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Don't click on it because... Uh, Don't start with this crap. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways. I have to be careful because uh, Rainbow Plasma is here and he will hit me. I... Whoa! <laughs> no, he won't. Whoa. <laughs> let's let's not go giving away any of my secrets. <laughs> so yeah, that is everything for this podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was weird for me because I, I'm recording in a weird place. Um, but next week I'll be back in my regular place in my safe <laughs> recording studio that is my apartment. <laughs> no, this actually went fine. The only the only thing that annoyed me was the fact I couldn't I couldn't like reach over and tell people to move on (laughs) i had to physically look at you and be like move on yeah (laughs) Uh, but yeah anyways that is everything for this week i hope you guys enjoyed it whether or not you're on the live stream or on youtube we love you all the same we've got a spoiler cast right after this episode so stay tuned if you want to hear a little bit about the latest episode of ponies and uh yeah my name is Rainbow Plasma. My bird. And I'm FlutterGuy317. And we'll see you guys next week. I'm not that most part. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the 14th spoiler cast for My Little Pony, done by the QDR Crusaders. My name is FlutterGuy317 and today I'm joined by Rainbow Plasma. Hello. And Atmospark. Hi. And unfortunately we're missing Burned, he uh, apparently had something to do or just forgot. Yeah, it sounds like he forgot. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so today we're going to be spoiler casting Season 4, Episode 15, Twilight Time, uh, which is a QDR Crusaders episode. It's a Philly episode, and I love the Philly episodes. Yeah, they're so cute. They um, always are. And in this episode, they um, kind of made a nod to the fact that Sweetie Belle isn't really good with her magic. Yeah, uh, to which is interesting, because like, every time I watch a Sweetie Belle episode, I never notice that. Like, we notice Scootaloo can't fly, Yeah. but I never notice that Sweetie Belle can't use magic. Yeah. It's because we're all racist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Damn unicorns. <laughs> Damn long foreheads. <laughs> yeah, but the the CMC episodes are always like really different from the other episodes. I find they're they're like a, their own little mini thing yeah, uh, a lot are. of the times. Um, and, and it's and it's interesting because they do definitely have a different dynamic. But I think this is one of the more enjoyable ones that I found. Uh, like I've never been a huge fan of them. They're a part of the show and I like them. But uh, but yeah, this is definitely probably my one of the better ones I found. And uh, it was really interesting because it it felt different from any other Cutie Mark Crusader um, episode that I've seen so far. I'm not sure if anybody else picked up on that, but it definitely felt different. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not very common that they directly inter- interrelate with like the main six characters like this. I mean, they, they do every now and then, incidentally, but not so much directly like this, where it's they're going to see Twilight and hanging out with Twilight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and Pinkie Pie just... <laughs> Yeah, Pinkie Pie was there for a brief cameo in the uh, the restaurant. Thing. Yeah, well, she was better than the last episode's <laughs> cameo. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've seen like uh, the whole sister who's social thing, where they're hang- hanging out with their sisters, or like in the uh, Sleepless and Ponyville. But it was interesting because it was kind of one on one with Twilight, or one on three with Twilight, and um, I don't know. It was it was kind of neat seeing Twilight take on that mentoring role for the the Phillies because um, we've seen her like m- kind of mentor her friends or like at least be there for her friends um, but we haven't seen her like as a teacher and you would think that you know having gone through Celestia's school and stuff that she would and since she's so like into books and learning that, that she'd be passing that on well I mean like I, I was telling you that she she looked like Celestia in this episode comparatively. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you replace uh, all the all the fillies with um, with you know the regular characters, 
and Twilight with Celestia, then it kind of makes a little bit of sense, and, and it it really is eerie how it's kind of worked. But, you know, one of the things that really interests me about this show is kind of how realistic it is to, like, comparatively speaking to real life and how that works. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, that's just that's just the reality of, of lives. It's, you know, you're not just one person. Uh, you know, Twilight has her own personality with her friends and her own conflicts and things like that but then she also has a completely different life where she's a mentor to people and she's a she's a an an adult figure to these kids who that she wants to look after yeah yeah it's it's like if you know anyone who's a teacher it's like that they'll go out with you on the weekend and do whatever they want and have fun and then during the week they're this authority figure that teaches kids stuff yeah, I mean, it's, every everybody has that experience where they 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 realize. I think it especially happens when you leave home. Um, you kind of realize that you are more than one person. You are you are like you're someone's kid, mm-hmm. but you're also your own person, and you might be a mentor to someone, and you might be you know you figure out that like you as one person end up being like five or six different people. So it's really it, it's just interesting that they can kind of convey that in such a short amount of time. Because a lot of the times with these shows, it's not necessarily that they don't think about it, but they don't have enough time to really get down to it. But this show, more than others, I find, seems to really, again, give these kind of 3D characters, these, um, you know, really deep characters with lots of different personality traits and Mm -hmm. different situations and stuff like that. Kudos to the great writers that we get to. Yeah, Yeah, it's been, it's been getting better lately. Um, I think it was last last week I wasn't on the spoiler cast, um, but uh, I, w- I know I was talking to you, uh, Flutter Guy, about how um, I really enjoyed the writing, and I thought the writing last week was one of the best best written episodes in a long, long time. It was it was really incredible, um, and, and I think I think this one was written well too. It, it had I think especially Twilight was written amazingly, and, and she. She had a lot of wonderful reactions, and the way she, that she handled stuff was so mature. And of course, I'm saying this, and you're playing a clip of her eating, <laughs> which is the complete opposite of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes, but but she she was so mature. I mean, like if you consider the way that she handled um, hearing about what the what the CMC were doing, she was like, "All right, well, prove it." Not in like a mean way, not to like show them up, but to be like, "All right, well, like I want to know. Like, do you really appreciate these lessons?" And they showed it, and they weren't exactly, uh, you know, on the ball about it. And so then, you know, Diamond Tiara and Silver Spoon were like, well, I guess you didn't come here to learn. And she immediately shot back with, like, a really mature response saying, well, none of you did, too. You know, like, she she played the mentor role really well, like, in- incredibly well, to a point where I was starting to compare her to Celestia. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what she is. She's the, she is the Celestia to the Phillies. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could probably say that about a lot of different um, uh, adult characters in their lives. Like, uh, not not so much as Twilight, because Twilight's got the book smarts and the and the teachings and the stuff. Pep but smart. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like Cheerilee too, maybe um, as a teacher, uh, you know, she's kind of a mentor to to the, the kids and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something else that I liked about this episode was um, it's not very often in cartoons like this that the characters in the show actually notice change or they don't say that they notice the change. Whereas at the start of this, when the Kinara Crusaders were all like, Hey, yeah, we hang out with princess twilight. They actually say princess twilight, not just twilight. And then yeah. diamond tiara and silver spoon are saying, yeah, well, she used to just be twilight, but now she is princess twilight. It's, it's not very often that you actually notice that change in these, in, in cartoons. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard so much whining in the fandom this season about the <laughs> fact that they don't acknowledge that she's a princess. And I've always disagreed with that fact. And, and it's funny because this episode almost kind of made me think of the fandom in a way. Like, all the little fillies were were um, were the fandom saying, like, I just want you to acknowledge it. I just want you to say that she's a princess. <laughs> and, and I, you know, like, I think, I think that's silly. You know, I, I think that it can be a plot point, but Twilight doesn't want it to be a plot point, and and the way that other people are handling handling it are are good too. You know, like I don't want it to be this huge deal. I you know Twilight kind of handled it like, well, I I guess if if you guys want to have autographs and that's cool, but you know it's not like she expected it or she was going ugh over it or it's always a huge deal. It's just yeah, 
life goes on and and I like the fact and the, the reason why I like that is I think I think and this is kind of getting deep but I think I think in general our society p- pays way too much attention to the idea of celebrity holds people up way too high and then crushes them and it, like mm-hmm. horribly oh, yeah. and it, it in every single aspect from the fans to the actual celebrities themselves it it it's it's awful and uh, I like the way that they approach celebrities in this show because they either make them so ridiculous or they treat it like a non-issue like here. I don't want to see Twilight be a celebrity. I don't want people to even acknowledge it because it gives this idea that she's better. And something that she's always said is that she's not better. And, and people should know that. Just because she has something special doesn't mean that she's better than people. And I think people in the fandom need to get over that fact and people need to just chill out about it because it's an it's something that's there but it doesn't need to be a huge deal and if you make it a huge deal then it leads to bad consequences well it's like um the whole immaturity versus maturity thing i think that like the majority of episodes thus far in season four um have kind of showed the maturity of her friends and of like all the other ponies because they didn't like uh, make a big deal out of her being princess. They have brought it up before in the past, like with Rainbow Dash teaching her how to fly and uh, stuff like that. But it wasn't like a big like deal, like you know, oh my God, you're a celebrity, you're better than us. Um, but in this, it's like you know, they're dealing with Phillies, young young kids um, who kind of really look up to like celebrities or even like celebrity like perso- uh, personas. And so, with Twilight being like a, a new princess in town. It's like, I think it was kind of natural for, for the kids to, I don't know, latch on, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like the kid episodes, like every episode has like a lesson, quote unquote, right? And, but I, I feel like the kid episodes are like way more directed towards the viewer, whether mm-hmm. that viewer be within the target audience or not. I think it's directed towards the viewer, whereas the other episodes are we're more kind of observing and we can, we can use it if we want to, but... It, you know, they're more situational, whereas I feel like I, with all the CMC ones, it's always very directed to the viewer being like, no, seriously, you should learn this lesson. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. like <laughs> I don't know what it is about him, but yeah, maybe it's just because I, I, I see a lot of people acting a lot like the CMC and, and the CMC are, are much, are learning kind of more basic lessons, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's lessons that I guess a lot of people can relate to from their childhood. Like, you you want it to be part of the popular bunch. And, I mean, people who are adults still do want to be in the popular bunch. But I think it's something that you kind of grew out of, or at least a little bit, um, to some extent. But uh, when you're a kid, you know, you want to be the, with the popular kids at the playground or whatever. And that's what the CMC are trying to do with this whole thing. And, unfortunately, it backfires on them. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, in a raging horde of zombie uh, ponies. <laughs> uh, hmm. Yeah, there was uh there were zombie ponies, um, so to speak. <laughs> you know, this crazy horde of horde of ponies, my goodness. Yeah. Um that's a little intimidating actually. And I'm I'm happy the way that like they that Twilight handled it, um, like you were saying, where she was very calm and collected about it. But it's just like having this mass of like kids kind of coming up and like surrounding you and fawning over you is like I don't know. It's got to be tough, and like, there's a lot of ways that she could have handled it really badly, and I and I just li- I like the fact that they I like the fact that they recognized that the people who should have been handling the stuff badly were the CMC. So they made all their decisions questionable, and they made them learn the lesson. But when it came down to a decision like Twilight had to make, they were like, "Look, it, we're, it's not it's not supposed to be super complicated. So let's make her the smart one this episode." Whereas you know, in some episodes, she might not be you know, super smart about this kind of stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of continuity. We're just watching it and, uh, you know, there's that picture of the box in the background trying to figure out the keys and everything like that. Yeah. It's okay, Twilight. I'm smart. <laughs> I can tell you what the keys are. I can imagine... You, 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 on, on that poster, you see there's three keys that are highlighted and we've already seen three keys in the show. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine Twilight being, like, um, some sort of investigator, like... Uh, in like a beautiful mind connecting dots and like uh all sorts of stuff like crazy crypto analysis about the box i I could see where she would like get into something like that yeah (laughs) yeah well i'm sorry twilight but you can't you can't lock pick the box (laughs) that's not how this works yeah 
Also, Lord Pippington British Hooves. <laughs> I know. Oh my god. I can't separate him out from his friendship as a He was so person. British. Yeah. Did you notice yeah. that? Did you notice that, yeah. Spark? How British he was? <laughs> yeah, he, he couldn't have been any more British. I, I guess Unless I'd he forgotten. was carrying a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah because I, I guess I'd forgotten. <laughs> I guess I'd forgotten because of the friendship is witchcraft thing making it so over the top. So I was like, ah, no, there's no way he could be that British in the show. Yeah, and then he just came up now, and it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that deep pad in the background? <laughs> it might be. Shout out to deep pad. <laughs> yeah. we're, uh, we're looking at a screenshot of the episode, and there's yeah. a, there's there's a pony with a sick fro in the <laughs> yeah. background. Yeah. Um. Actually, in this screenshot, one of the the moments to stick with me, and I don't know why, probably because I, I'm a vector artist and like I, I kind of pay a lot of attention to making eyes and stuff. There's this there's this point where Sweetie Belle grabs Scootaloo and Apple Bloom and is like, "Oh, we're gonna show show Twilight, you know, what we've been working on." And Apple Bloom's eyes, like her irises, are huge and her yeah. pupils are not, and it's just like big derp face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, oh, there was a couple of really cute faces in this too as well. In this well, episode. I mean, that one Scootaloo face, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one at the very beginning is like the super squee. Yeah. yeah. Also, what about the Scootaloo duck face? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the Apple Bloom duck face. She's like, what was with yeah. this? <laughs> Everybody's, every pony's quacking. Uh, I, uh, I kind of, I kind of liked Apple Bloom more so than usual in this episode, and I think... I think I really like Apple Bloom when she plays kind of like the, the the straight man to the other two being a little bit eccentric, because Sweetie Belle is eccentric in one way and 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 Scootaloo is eccentric in the other way. And I think I really like when Apple Bloom acts as like a calming force, and she was for like the first half of the episode, and then it went straight out the window, uh, which was <laughs> yeah. too, which was too bad. But like there was a couple of lines from Apple Bloom, like when she, at the very beginning when she was like you're laying that on a bit thick there pal oh yeah that was great with and when the flower that coughed <laughs> and, and when she was talking to sweetie bell and she was like literally two seconds ago <laughs> you said this and now you're changing your like i think i think that's where personally apple bloom really hits her stride with me is is playing that kind of like are you serious like like we are crazy but this is crazy even for us kind of kind of role <laughs> um I, I really like seeing that, so I, I hope in the future I get to see more Apple Bloom like that because I don't know. I, I guess I guess Apple Bloom has never been like my favorite CMC, hmm. um, but I, I really enjoy it when when she plays the straight man. Mm-hmm. How about them Sweetie Bell voice cracks? <laughs> yeah, um, people are saying that her voice changed the this episode, and yeah, Claire Corlett's voice is changing because she's growing up. Um, so it's going to (laughs) change, but, uh, she had quite a few voice cracks. So that was, but like people were saying it, it didn't sound like Sweetie Belle and they're completely wrong or they can't tell voices Yeah, because it sounded like Sweetie Belle. There was even notice a difference. Yeah. Yeah. There were certain points where if you were paying attention, like I didn't notice it the first time, but then someone pointed out to me that with the second time I went through it, like I listened a little bit close, closer and it did sound like she was getting older a little bit, but it was not noticeable. And like, again, it doesn't. It she still sounds like Sweetie Belle, like it's not like suddenly they replaced it with like a, a Spanish like <laughs> voice actress, you know. Yeah. Like <laughs> speaking of uh, voices, um, I think who was it? Kathy Westlock, who voices Spike, voiced one of the uh, the small ponies. Yeah, it was so easy to tell too. Yeah, there's Spike. Spike spoke through a pony this episode. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Spike, though, um, <laughs> that poor guy in the end. I really feel for Spike. <laughs> nah, I love it. It's yeah. I would eat all of those nachos right I now. I know. I can't believe he threw them out. Why was he Why was he complaining? He yeah. was just like, oh, I can't believe I made all these nachos. What are we <laughs> going to do with all these nachos? Spike, let me just eat them. <laughs> bro, bro, let me, let me, let me teach you something. <laughs> <laughs> nachos, nachos are food. I wonder if he cooked them with his own breath. <laughs> no, because then Celestia would get like a rain. Oh, oh my god, can that please happen? <laughs> Nachos. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Used the wrong fire breath. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um so going back to, to your point about Apple Bloom in this episode playing the straight man, uh I kind of like the more and more I see of the CMC, the more they kind of act like their sisters. Or pseudo sisters with the case of Scootaloo and Rainbow Dash. Yeah. Um. Because like, Applejack is is usually portrayed as the the honest like, um, straight man pony, and like she does go insane sometimes when she overworks herself. But like, 
it seems like to I guess to Rarity's drama or to Rainbow Dash's um, excitability. It, yeah, <laughs> uh, Applejack has kind of like always been the the voice of reason, and so I think it it kind of shows in their younger portrayals too with the with their sisters yeah so it's really subtle though like it's not it's not over the top it's not like this is what rarity would be if, if she was like 10 years younger it was it was more like <laughs> yeah 10 years that was a bit much um but like it, it's it's kind of really subtle but sweetie bell but they don't have last names so I, I can't I, I was gonna use like a last sweetie, name sweetie Bellity. <laughs> well no i was just gonna say like i was gonna say like the the blank gene yeah, yeah. Uh, shone through in sweetie bell uh today but the rarity gene really shone through in, in sweetie bell today yeah um kind of taking charge and saying no don't worry i've got everything yeah. under control and then yeah. and then you know that or, kind of stuff something happening. like that something like uh Guys, don't worry, I got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's it, so. Uh, yeah, it, it was interesting because you do kind of you do kind of see their sisters um, are starting to have a little bit of an influence. And I, you know, I think that I think that happens though with siblings. You know, like hmm. I, I feel like you either you either like play off of your siblings, like they're doing here, like you get kind of like similar traits, or you kind of like do the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, there hasn't been really like sibling opposition in this show too much yeah. i mean sweetie bell had a little bit of it when she was like rarity you're always trying rarity. to do proper stuff but yeah. then she always defaults back to like sweetie bell's pretty proper too you know so well i don't know uh i mean compared this... to like scootaloo and, and yeah. apple bloom she's yeah, still got true. like she just still got like a quaffed mane and, <laughs> yeah and still talks about you know being she was like the influence in this episode's like ooh, I, you know let's be popular kind of thing so there's, yeah. some, there's some stuff rubbing off there. Also, those those sunglasses that she was wearing at the, <laughs> <laughs> that lemonade yeah. stand opening spoke really yeah. like, oh man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they should have. To they totally should have brought um, Babs back in for this one because she's <laughs> totally a key to my crusader. She is. They yeah. can't bring her back for everything though. She lives in a different city. Yes, I can. <laughs> they should fly her in for the, this one. They should just like move her to Ponyville. <laughs> Uh, no, they, then they have to move Coco Pamel. Yeah, which they should do too. This is the, I mean, come this on, is this is the deal we'll make. They're like, not allowed to move Babsy you, unless they move Coco Pamel. Hasbro, please move yeah. Coco Pamel and, then, but, then, and but, but, but then we would need a fourth member for our archer. Uh, no, we've got four. Okay, ignore me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was, Sorry, Bird. That was smart. <laughs> Sorry, Bird. You're not with us anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, all right. We, we unfortunately. I'm do tired. Have to... Leave me alone. Oh. <laughs> And you lost your voice, but that's another yeah, thing. Uh, that's true. We do have to wrap up, though, because we're kind of running short on time. Uh, so thank you guys for watching the spoiler cast. We hope you join us next week for our spoiler cast of episode 16 of season 4 of My Little Pony, uh, because it'll be fun. There's sure. still 11 more episodes of Pony. That's really nice. Yeah. I feel like sometimes we only notice how many are left when there's, like, one or two left. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh, look, there's still 11. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like <laughs> last right. season. Last yeah. season, it had already be over. Oh, yeah. It, it was already over, like, two episodes ago. Yeah, so. yeah. Everything from this point out is, like... Bonus! Yeah. And then for five more years. So, you know, there's that. Five more years. <laughs> five more years. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Before we... uh, all right, so thank you guys for watching, and join us next week for QDR Crusaders and for our spoiler cast after that. Uh... Thank you guys again. Uh, my name is FlutterGuy317. I'm Rainbow Plasma. And I'm Admiral Spark. Bye. See you guys next week. Dumb up deep boys.